Robert Spencer here for Jihad Watch, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and for the Center for Security Policy. Pope Francis recently met in the Vatican with Dr. Mohammed bin Abdul Karim Al Issa, the Secretary General of the Muslim World League, a group that has been linked to the financing of jihad terror. During the meeting, Al Issa thanked the Pope for his fair positions on what he called the false claims that link extremism and violence to Islam. In other words, Al Issa was thanking the Pope for dissembling about the motivating ideology of jihad terror, which his group, the Muslim World League, has been accused of financing and for defaming other religions in an effort to whitewash Islam. Now, mind you, I don't object to the Pope's meeting this man. After all, Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But the meeting appears to have been a pointless feel-good session, probably featuring some sly dawah from Al-Issa. According to Breitbart News, the two men reportedly exchanged views on a number of issues of common interest, including peace and global harmony, and discussed cooperation on issues of peaceful coexistence and the spread of love. The spread of love, yes. That's what the Muslim World League is all about. Nor was this the first time that a Muslim leader has thanked the Pope for being so very useful. Last July, Ahmed al Tayeb, the Grand Imam of Cairo's Al Azhar, thanked him for his defense of Islam against the accusation of violence and terrorism. Has any other Pope of Rome in the history of Christianity ever been heralded as a defender of Islam? Of course not. But the Catholic Church has come a long way since the days of Pope Calixtus III, who vowed in the year 1455 to, quote, exalt the true faith and to extirpate the diabolical sect of the reprobate and faithless Muhammad in the East. If time travel could be arranged and Pope Francis could be made to meet Calixtus III, Calixtus could expect a punch because Francis is not just a defender of Islam, but a defender of the Sharia death penalty for blasphemy. After Islamic jihadis murdered the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists who had drawn Muhammad, Francis obliquely justified the murders by saying that it is true that you must not react violently, but although we are good friends, if an aide says a curse word against my mother, he can expect a punch. It's normal. You can't make a toy out of the religions of others. These people provoke, and then something can happen. In freedom of expression, there are limits. So for the Pope, murdering people for violating Sharia blasphemy laws is normal. And it isn't terrorism, for Christian terrorism, he said, does not exist. Jewish terrorism does not exist. And Muslim terrorism does not exist. They do not exist. He said that in a speech last February. He went on, there are fundamentalist and violent individuals in all peoples and religions, and with intolerant generalizations, they become stronger because they feed on hate and xenophobia. So you see, as far as the Pope is concerned, there is no Islamic terrorism, but if you engage in intolerant generalizations, you can expect a punch. The Pope, like the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, apparently thinks that the problem in the world today is not jihad terror, but non-Muslims talking about jihad terror. Muslims would be peaceful if non-Muslims would simply censor themselves and self-impose Sharia blasphemy restrictions regarding criticism of Islam. For Pope Francis has no patience with those who discuss such matters. He says, I don't like to talk about Islamic violence, because every day when I read the newspaper, I see violence. He said, when he reads the newspaper, he reads about an Italian who kills his fiance or mother-in-law. The pontiff added, they are baptized Catholics. They are violent Catholics. He said if he spoke about Islamic violence, then he would have to speak about Catholic violence as well. Now, that comparison just made no sense at all. For Italian Catholics who kill their fiancés or mothers-in-law were not acting in according with the teachings of their religion. While the Quran and Islamic teaching do contain numerous exhortations to violence. But Pope Francis, defender of Islam, cannot concern himself with such minutiae, nor does he appear to be particularly concerned about the fact that all his false statements about the motivating ideology behind the massive Muslim persecution of Christians over the last few years only enables and abets that persecution. For if that ideology is not identified and confronted, it will continue to flourish. The Pope of Rome, whom Catholics consider to be the earthly head of the Church, should be a defender of Christianity, 
not a defender of Islam, the religion that has been at war with Christianity and with Judeo-Christian civilization since its earliest days. That any Christian leader would be called a defender of Islam by anyone casts into vivid relief the absurdity of our age and the weakness of the free world. The creeping idolatry of the papacy that is rampant in today's Catholic Church, with all too many Catholics treating every word of the Pope as if it were a divine oracle, only makes matters worse. Can you imagine any Muslim leader ever being called a defender of Christianity? Of course not. Muslim leaders are more aware than their fond defender in the Vatican that Islam mandates warfare against unbelievers, not defense of the unbeliever's theological views. Pope Francis is not only disastrously wrongheaded about an obvious fact that is reinforced by everyday's headlines, he is also deceiving and misleading his people about a matter of utmost importance and keeping them ignorant and complacent about a growing and advancing threat. I'm Robert Spencer.